And so this morning, um, just as the Lord would have it, perhaps in the heart of First John, John deals with the Christian's doubt. The Christian's doubt. And so, as you know, our series in First John is a, a series titled The Marks of Christian Assurance or The Evidences of Christian Assurance. And we've seen various. We've seen the reality of Christ. We've seen the reality of love. We've seen the reality of obedience. But we've also looked at some negatives. The reality on the assurance of deliverance that Christ delivered us rightly from sin, death, and Satan. We've also looked at a negative, I would say, which is the assurance of antichrists. Antichrists are among us. They have been for the last 2,000 years. And some would fix their attention to who is the ultimate antichrist. And I want to encourage and implore you to rather fix your eyes on the true Christ. Because it's His arrival we wait for. Now, this morning on another negative note, I say negative, it's not like we're going to talk about something negative. It's in the negative sense. It's the assurance of doubt. Let me tell you something, as Christians, I can assure you that at some point in your life, if not now, you have doubted your salvation. Some of us continually doubt our salvation. That it was the work sufficient for me. That I truly believe. What if I just wanted to believe? This is something serious, my friends. It's, it's a serious issue when we doubt our salvation. Now, we might have experienced seasons upon seasons of assurance. We might go through seasons. We don't, we don't even have the idea of questioning our faith. We say, I'm good. I'm comforted. I'm content. I'm on the right path. Look, the Lord has had favor upon me. And then one morning, one morning you wake up in tears thinking you have forsaken your first love. And how did it get to this? I was fine not too long ago. How did it get to this? To question the reality of God's saving work. Have you been there? Yes? No? Are you there? My dear friends, we are in the right place, I believe. You see, I think what happens is this. We become so content in our Christian walk that we lose sight of truly being in devotion. We lose sight of what it truly means to be in God's presence. But we're comfortable. And so, as sin lures, creeps up, we allow it. We entertain it. Until we've become so overwhelmed by sin's demise. We, and when we realize, why am I doubting our faith? Oftentimes, it's, it's such a long way that has come. We've really been, in, you know, inviting and entertaining the doubt sin brings. And it's a pattern, I think. It's a pattern because we want to be comfortable. And once we're comfortable, we forsake our first love. We say it's going well spiritually. And when it goes well spiritually, my friends, isn't it that some mornings when we wake up rather tired, we, but it's going well with the Lord and I. May I have half an hour of rest, Lord. I will talk to you tomorrow. Today, I know we're good, Lord. And we keep tasting the waters. And we keep tasting the waters. Until we are in the deep end. With cemented feet. Right? Can't come up. It's a pattern, I think. And we only notice it once it's gone too far. So... What happens next is we start to condemn ourselves. We condemn ourselves. You know what? You, man, you're so evil. Look at where we are. Look at what you've done. Why did we not stay in devotion with the Lord? Why are we not calling upon His name? So there's the self-condemnation instead of calling on the Lord. 
Peter says, cast your cares on the Lord, for it's He who cares for you. No, no, no. Condemn thyself. Man, wretched man that I am. Woe is me. I am terrible. Now, I want to say that some of us are more thoughtful and oftentimes more down than others. Sometimes we question our health and how, how you feel, how a person feels, also affects how a person thinks. Listen, I graciously had COVID in December in that first week and there was one night I thought, I need to go to hospital. What if I start to panic and cannot breathe? We start to question things. We start to doubt things, right? Another thing is this. You may be struggling with a specific sin. And because of that, you suddenly doubt the entire work of God in your heart. And so it's various circumstances, right? It can be external, and it's definitely internal. And these things bring doubt, and once we doubt, we condemn thyself. But whatever the case, this is a real problem. Doubting our salvation is a real problem. So the question I have this morning before I read for us is how do we as believers deal with our doubt? How do we as believers deal with this doubt? Friends, I want to encourage you and say our verses this morning in 1 John chapter 3, verse 19 to 24 give us the comfort for when doubt starts to entice us. And we have five truths this morning. Five truths. I want to read for us as we get into the first truth of God's grace being greater. From verse 19, John says the following, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask from Him, or whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we keep His com commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God, and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the, the Spirit whom He has given us. So back to those first two verses, verse 19 and 20. The first truth John gives us in overcoming doubt, or the doubt of our salvation, he says, remember that God's grace is greater. It's greater than your heart. It's greater than your mind. It's greater than the very thing that's condemning you. So when we ask that question, am I really saved? What's the verdict we pass on ourselves very often? And be honest. What's the verdict we pass on ourselves? I believe it's this. I don't know. I don't know. Why don't you know? Because of doubt. The moment we doubt, we, we question everything. Many may, may say, but I believe I have passed from death to life. But to yourself, it seems so doubtful. Did I really pass from death to life? Because when I think to myself, my conscience is telling me you're guilty. You didn't pass from death to life. And I believe what happens is this. The evidence of our union with Christ becomes blurred because of this doubt. And because it's blurred, we know we're guilty. So now we condemn. I'm guilty, so I deserve death. And we ask or question our salvation. We, we even start to think that we've been deceived. Maybe I thought I was saved. Especially if you did the sinner's prayer. 
We question, was that enough? Do I really believe? What is faith? Here's the thing. In the greater context of John chapter 3, John gives us a hinge verse in verse 18. In verse 18, which we studied um, two weeks ago, he says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. The subject is love. Love is the comforting assurance. If you love and you know you truly love, then you can also know that His grace for you is greater than your doubt. It's greater than your self-condemnation. You see, we can almost say, when we love with truth and action, this is the thing that assures our hearts before God that we are of the truth, as He says in verse 19. In other words, assurance will sprout in our hearts when we begin to truly and authentically love those around us. Look at your service to your family, to your neighbors, to those in church. Am I genuine in loving these people? Am I genuine in serving these people? And if you as believers say, but of course I am then isn't that same witness or that same evidence true of your relation to Christ? That I am serving Him, that I am loving Him, not the way I'm supposed to, perhaps for a season, but I am. I do love Him. I do trust Him. See, loving others as God in Christ has loved us is what strengthens our hearts. This is what gives us the assurance of salvation. John says, that's how we come to know Genosko. To have intimate knowledge. That's how we come to have intimate knowledge that we belong to the truth. Is that we love one another. Now in verse 20, I'll read it for us again. Because it can be tricky to interpret. It says, for it, whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. When Christ has satisfied the sting of our sin through His work on the cross, John says, we will still experience a condemning heart. Okay, Remember, who is John writing this letter to? Help me out. Christians, the church, right? He's telling the church, you Christian who doubt your salvation, your heart, even though you have been saved by the glorious Christ, will condemn you. It will judge you. You will question your faith. But this is something God doesn't want us to have. Doubt. Doubt. So when my conscience sends me on a guilt trip, And I look in faith to God who is greater than this deceitful heart that I have. That is what assures me of my total and complete forgiveness through what Christ has done. Are you with me? Upward I look and see Him there. That's where we have the peace. Listen. The Bible teaches that it's impossible to be, or that it's possible to be saved, and yet we will have doubts. Yes, we will become discouraged. The Bible doesn't say you're going to walk around never doubting your salvation. I believe there was a portion in Peter's life, and yes, I do think there was an influence of fear of man upon him, but after the resurrected Christ had ascended and a few years after Peter had been faithfully ministering the gospel, he was doubting. He was doubting and he was tempted to go back to Judaism. And Paul called him out. Are you with me? So friends, it's not new for the Christian to doubt. Sometimes I doubt. Sometimes I disobey. Sometimes in my heart of heart, 
hate sprouts up. And I will say seemingly out of nowhere. And guess what? These things bother me. Do they bother you? Does it bother you when you doubt? Does it bother you when you disobey the Lord's commands? Does it bother you when you notice and realize that in your heart you were, you were busy doubting someone, or not doubting, judging someone with, de- with hate? Do those things bother you? Great! Okay? That's good. That's good news. It's not bad that these things bother you. I'll tell you why. Those who do not know Christ won't ask these questions. Those who do not know Christ cannot be bothered with disobedience and hate. Those who do not know Christ have a cold heart heart. Okay? So the moment you question, it's a good sign. It's an encouraging sign. Because the truth is, you are aware of the truth. That's why you can ask these questions. Let me move on. When your heart hurts and your conscience is condemning you, John says, look to God. Look to Christ. Look to the gospel. Because the gospel says, Christ is greater than our conscience. And He knows all things. Now my question is, exactly how does God's healing balm, like how does His healing ointment come upon me in these situations? How can I experience, knowingly experience, His grace and His love? I would say, when we realize, number one, as I've said, we're walking in Christian love. We are walking in Christian love. Because that shows where your heart is. If you're walking around blaming everyone, shouting at everyone, cursing everyone, are you going to have assurance that you love anyone? Of course not. Of course not. So we look at our action. We look at our response. But also, number two, it says this. God knows our hearts. Right? He knows all things. And He's greater than our heart. So when our heart blames us, judges us, condemns us, God says, I know all things. My peace, my assurance is greater than the condemnation that's in your heart. It's greater than the condemnation in your heart. You see, Jesus knows our hearts better than what we do. You know what Jesus says about our hearts? It's from the heart which flows all the evil, right? It's not what goes in a man, but what comes out of a man. And so the issue is, we're quick to condemn ourselves. In a moment where we give in to temptation and we sin, what is it that we do? There you go again. Why can you not be faithful? Why can you not just overcome the temptation? Is that what Jesus does? No, you see, when we condemn ourselves, we retreat from the throne. We walk away from the throne and condemn ourselves. When the writer of Hebrews says, no, 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 come to the throne of grace. When Peter says, cast your cares on Him, it's an invitation that when your heart wants to condemn you, realize what He has done and that His grace exceeds any evil you think you can even come up with. His grace is greater. And then when we remember who Christ is and who we are in Christ, we have that assurance. We have that assurance. Do you understand? Point number one. That His grace is greater than your doubt. It's greater than your self-condemnation. 
Amen. Because that brings us to a second truth. Oftentimes when we experience this condemnation, the first thing we run away from is communion with God. And John says, if you want to have the assurance of your salvation, and if you want to overcome doubt, pray. Pray. But here's the thing. We don't pray because we're in doubt. John says, no, 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 no. That's the very place we have confidence is in prayer. So point number two, we have confidence in prayer. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask prayer, we receive from Him. Whatever we ask, John is talking about explicit prayer. You see, when, when we trust the judgment of God, when we trust the hand of God, our confidence shifts from being based on what I'm able to do, what I believe. Our confidence shifts from our feelings and our emotions to what, God, to what God's Word says about us. You know what God's Word tells me when I doubt my salvation? Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Amen? So run to Christ Jesus. That's the shelter. Don't run away from Christ. Run toward Christ. He's our shelter. Are you with me? But when we doubt, we shrink away from prayer. We shrink away from Christ. John says that's where we stand boldly. That's where we ask and we receive. You see, confidence before God is what, what gives us motivation. It's what gives us assurance. How do we have confidence before God? When we stand in Him with prayer. We stand in Him with prayer. John says we have confidence before God and can receive whatever we ask from Him. Then he goes on to say, conditional clause, which I'll deal with in a moment. The conditional clause is, we keep His commandments and do what's pleasing in His sight. So if our heart doesn't condemn us, as Spurgeon says, then we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. So my friends, if we have a clear conscience before God, we can come to God with confidence. And, and that confidence is what gives us the assurance that He will listen. He will listen. Listen, this is why doubt is also important. See, when we start to doubt and question these realities, the reality of our salvation, are we caught in sin? Are we entrapped in sin? When we ask these questions, it points us to the reality that outside of the grace of God, we are condemned sinners. But because we stand in God, we are forgiven saints. We are children. And as a child draws near to their parent, they ask and they receive. John says, come and ask and you will receive. See, doubt, doubt starts to creep away. Are you following me? Doubt starts to creep away when we walk in prayer. You talk to people who faithfully pray all the time. There's not a scent of doubt majority of the time. It's because it's a genuine relationship. There's a true reality of Christ's presence in that person's life. And therefore, when we say whatever we ask in prayer, we'll receive from Him. Friends, if you haven't noticed, I want to encourage you to, to, to pay attention that when we as a church pray, it's not because CBC is praying. Now we know our prayers will be answered. No, no, no. 
It's because we as a church walk in prayer before God and we pray. Man, we've seen prayers being answered. Some which have taken months praying faithfully week in and faithfully week out. And we see the Lord's hand and we go, praise the Lord. We know that this has been a long time. Other times we pray and in the next moment we hear of the relief. We hear of the breakthrough. We hear of the providence. Amen? I mean, those of you who are in prayer meetings at Bible study, you know these things because you hear these testimonies. An example was, was, was our brother Brent, who had the accident. And what's the first thing we have? Doubt. Man, we pray, Lord, if it be all, we'll restore our brother's hand. And we trust, as the surgeon had given feedback, that even his nail bed has been restored. To me, it's unthinkable, friends. And let me be frank. In majority of cases, you lose that bit. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Our sister Dominique been praying for a resolution to finish her studies. Because sadly, the only way to her, which seemed like finishing, was a, not a closed door, but a locked door. And we prayed for that situation. And on Wednesday she shared with us that a different door was open. An unthinkable door. A door that may seem she's, as if she's going on a slip and slide finishing her studies. And we praise the Lord. Because not only do we ask and He receives, he give, or we receive, He gives more than what we even imagined we would receive. Amen? That His hand of blessing pours. He doesn't give sparingly. He gives mightily. The Basson family know this as they prepare for mission, and as they prepare for a mission season. The hand of God has been upon them has been upon the mission. And we trust we'll be in the season, out in the field. So my friends, the question is this. Why do we still shrink away from prayer? I do want to clarify something very important. There's a fine line where this text can be taken out of context. Okay? This verse is not a genie in a bottle. Rub it and receive what you wish. Christ Himself and the Apostle John in this very letter clarifies. The one who can claim this verse is the one who obeys His word. In other words, it's the one who does His will. So later in this letter, chapter 5 verse 14, John says... And this is the confidence we have, which we have before Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. He hears us. When you pray out of context, when you pray outside of God's will, it's in vain. It's in vain. And here's the comforting thing I want to assure you of. The only time you will pray outside of God's will is when you live outside of God's will. But when you're walking in the, in the will of God, man, do, 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 praying according to the will of God. And it's just so assuring. It's so assuring. So what qualifies me asking and receiving? Being in God's will. Being in God's will. God doesn't give you what you pray for based on your good merit. Oh, but Lord, I've done these things. You cannot bargain with God. We, we don't bargain with Christ. A condition for answered prayer is that we pray according to His will and do according to His will. Which brings us to a third truth this morning. That, that last bit of verse 22. It says this. Because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. Does He give us what we ask for? Yes. 
conditional clause because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him now I we can almost say that the man of obedience is the man who God will hear if you want the Lord to hear you then you better be walking in his will walking in his grace 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says this whatever you do I love just how it starts like that whatever you do and we would think of mighty things working taking on projects being responsible Uh, Paul gives us example he says whatever you do whether something small like eat or drink do it all to the glory of God because we might think only these big projects only these big acts these are the things we need to do to the glory of God and everything else we can just do Paul says your life the action of your life the direction that your life points should be to the glory of God Which means I'm not consumed with my own agenda. I'm not consumed with my own will. I'm not consumed with my own ambitions. Because that's why your prayers aren't being answered, by the way. The Lord's not answering me. Why do you think He's not? Because we're walking in disobedience. And then others would say, but you need more faith. No, you need repentance. Listen, when you are consumed with what God wants you to do, when you are consumed with what pleases Him, 1 uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 1 tells us, he says in context, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us, as to how you ought to walk and please God that you may excel still more if you want to see the hand of God in your prayers upon your life then you need to start living as if you belong to Him listen to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 6 he says "So, so we are always of good courage We know that while we are at home, the context is, while we're on earth, in the body, we are away from the Lord, context, from the heavenlies. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Yet, whether we are at home or away, we will make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of God, or Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We tend to think when I walk according to God's will, He sees me. He sees you even when you don't. The reality is, do I want to walk in the favor of the Lord? If yes, then live in the obedience of his instruction he said but how can I know what God's will is for my life scripture is so clear scripture is so clear that, that number one which is most important is to love the Lord your God with all your heart mind, soul and strength that's how you do the will of God Because when you love God with all your mind, your thoughts are of God. Your thoughts are His thoughts, the psalmist says. I mean, His thoughts are your thoughts. Your heart's desire is His desires. Your ability and your skills are His. My dear friends, doing what God commands and pleasing Him. That is what produces confidence 
in our prayer. We doubt prayer because we live by a rule of doubting God's hand. You want assurance in prayer? Fulfill His commands. Obey His word. Obey His instruction. This is what gives us the assurance of His gift of salvation. Because here's the other reality. And this should comfort us. You can't do what He says unless He enables you. Unless He enables you. Yeah, we can be legalistic. But here's the thing. Legalism is sin. The Pharisees were far from the Father. Yet they thought what they were doing is right. If you do the right thing with the wrong motive, in the eyes of God, you're wrong. It brings us to another point, And it's this. If we ultimately want the assurance that we're walking in His will, that He hears our prayers, that His grace is sufficient for us, then we need to trust Jesus. Our trust is in Jesus. Verse 23. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded. Believe in Jesus! That takes away all the doubt. Call upon the name of the Lord. It takes away all doubt. Listen, as you go through the list of things you make as a Christian, when you doubt, you may wonder at each one, did I really believe? Were my prayers sufficient? Is my heart in the right place? You may doubt all those things. But the one thing you shouldn't doubt is when you get to the question, do I still believe in Jesus? Do I still believe in Jesus? And you say to yourself, I do. I do. I trust Him. I trust that He died for me. I trust that He saved me from my sin. And you are absolutely correct to believe this. God's command is to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. What's the key word? Believe. Trust. It means to trust Him. It means to rely on Him. What's the next thing? Jesus' name. The name of Jesus conveys His person, His work, and all that He is, all that He has accomplished. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son. This emphasizes His eternal deity. This emphasizes His unique relationship to the Father. You see, Jesus is His human name. It's equivalent to the Hebrew name Joshua. It means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. Then we would say Christ. Christ isn't his second name. Christ is his title. It means anointed one. The Messiah of God. Let's put it all together. To believe in the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, is to place your trust, your faith, in Him and only Him and all that He is, the Divine Son, the incarnate deity, the sinless human, the perfect atonement for sin, the messianic savior is yours. He is yours and you are his. That's what it means to trust in our savior. You believe in all of him, not some of him, not a part of Him. You believe all of Him. You believe, and I'm sad to have to phrase it this way, but you believe the biblical Christ. The Christ who is painted to us in these words. From Genesis 1-1 to our final verse in Revelation. That's the Christ who you trust. No other Christ is sufficient. John goes on to say, 
that we also love one another as he commanded us. John is talking specifically. Remember, John walked with Christ. Amen. He saw everything. He heard all the commands. And so in his gospel, John 13, 34 through 35, this is what he records. He says, Jesus said to his disciples, this is before his betrayal. I give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. We cannot divorce love from the Christian walk. It's scattered throughout. It's the thread that holds all things together. One commentator, Warren Wesby, summarizes these verses. He says, Faith toward God and love toward man sums up a Christian's obligation. Christianity is faith which works by love. It's faith that works by love. As we love we give evidence, we testify of what Christ is doing and who we belong to. Faith and love is the foundations of our assurance because these are the evidence of God's work. They are the testimony of His Spirit. Which brings us to a fifth point. You guys have done so well. The final point. This is what takes away the doubt of our salvation. The Spirit's presence. The Holy Spirit's presence. I read for us once again in our final verse of chapter 3. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us. By the Spirit whom He has given us. So, because of the Holy Spirit, we share a common life with God. The Spirit fills us, renews us, draws us. And you might sit here and question, how do I know I have the Holy Spirit? How do I know I have the Holy Spirit? Now, many people will run to the gifts and say, but what gifts do you have? My dear friends, biblically, and here it is. If you have ever been filled with the Spirit, if you have ever been led by the Spirit, if you have ever been directed by the Spirit, instructed by the Spirit, taught of the Spirit, been graced by the Spirit, been gifted by the Spirit, or filled with the fruit of the Spirit, then we can have evidence that we have the Spirit. Listen. When your dead soul is made alive and your blind eyes were made to see and your sinful heart came to a point of repentance and you without any faith in Jesus Christ all of a sudden were drawn to Christ. You say, I believed. No, friends. No, 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 no. The Spirit's work in our hearts begins before we call upon the name of Jesus. The Spirit long draws us to the point where we acknowledge Christ as Savior. No man calls on Jesus as Lord but by the Holy Spirit. No one. We might think We do. We might have been taught that we are, but we aren't. The very gift of faith, faith which we need to have to believe, right? Faith which we need to have to call upon Jesus. That very gift is given by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in our hearts long before we realize we long for the Savior. I'm not saying we're filled by the Spirit before we're saved. That happens as we're saved. But the Spirit works in our hearts. 
Now having called upon Jesus as Lord, you must realize you have already experienced the Holy Spirit's work. You've given testimony to the Gospel and the Spirit has empowered this testimony. The Word of God suddenly becomes alive to you. You want to know why? Because now the Holy Spirit is your teacher. In the past you were just reading it. Now you've been taught it. You have prayed and the Spirit has energized those prayers. And your prayers have been answered. You've seen the evidence of the work of the Spirit in your life. You see the hand of the Spirit providentially orchestrating all things around you in your life. Which brings you to the right place at the right time to accomplish exactly the right thing in the perfect promises of God. That's how sovereign God is. That's how in control God is. And so, if we want to set our hearts at rest, then we realize this, and, and, and I want to conclude with this verse, powerful verse, and I'm sure you know what I'm referring to. Romans 5. Romans 5, my dear friends, we're overcoming the doubt of our salvation in the work of our salvation. Romans 5.5 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, meaning declared right, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also obtain access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice and are now able in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through who? The Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Listen, God loves you perfectly. And the way of showing that as a Christian is He's given you His Holy Spirit. He's given you the guarantee that His love is final. He can't love you any more than that. He can't love you any less than that. Because He loves you perfectly. And yet we doubt. Yet we question. So if we want to set our hearts at rest, when, when, when our heart accuses us and condemns us, we look to the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts. We look at how we have been enabled to pray and call upon the name of the Lord. We look at how we have been enabled to obey His commands. Because yes, we have obeyed His commands. And yes, we believe that Christ is all in all. That He is my final Lord. That He is my Savior. That, that He is my rescue. And as evidence, I love those who also belong to Him. Because that's the condition of Christ dwelling in us. So when we look to these truths, let's be comforted. Let's be assured. So it's a mindful task. You might leave you and think, oh, but this is another thing I must do. No, it's meditation. It's meditation. It's meditating on the truth so that you may have the assurance of God's love for you, for me, for a people who never deserved it, yet freely received it. Let me pray for us. O oh Lord, our Lord, our good God, our saving God, we pray that as we heard these realities this day, we ask that we would just be encouraged and comforted, that we would walk in constant peace of your great love. And so we thank you, and we pray it in your name. Amen.